Hi, I'm Michael Marin. At Holy Name Medical Center, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important health care issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. Healing begins here. Berkeley College. Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. NJM, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and more, with a focus on safety and financial stability. Wells Fargo, New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. And by the Russell Berry Foundation. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. That was from a uh, fascinating film called Food Chains. The director is here, Sanjay Rawal. Is the, that's your first film, isn't it? My first film. And this is a film that uh, follows a group of tomato pickers in Florida. These are uh, workers who often are taken advantage of, are abused, are not treated the way they should be treated. Why did you make this film? I made Food Chains because it brought together three parts of my life. My father was actually a tomato breeder, so I grew up in the tomato industry in California. I worked for 15 to 20 years in human rights all over the world. And at the same time, I moved from California to New York City to study with an Indian spiritual teacher, Sri Chinmoy, to learn about inner peace, gratitude, those types of things. But it wasn't until I saw the conditions of workers in Florida that I realized, number one, we don't know where our food comes from. Number two, conditions in this country are just as bad as they are anywhere in the world. And number three, when I say thanks for my food in my own way, I wasn't thinking about the hands that picked that food. Mm. And Eva Longoria, uh, the terrific actress, you got her involved here. She is an executive producer. Describe how you got her and why she's played such an important role in this film. Eva Longoria is at once the busiest person, I think, on the planet besides the president, and at the same time, one of the most politically astute. While she was wrapping up Desperate Housewives, the role which most people know her for, she was going to night school at Cal State Northridge, getting her master's degree in Chicano studies. She'd already done one documentary on farm workers called The Harvest. Mm -hmm. And when our other executive producer, the author of Fast Food Nation, Eric Schlosser, told her about this film, she immediately wanted to get involved. And her support, her guidance, but more importantly, her intellect really helped us make the film what it is today. You, you said she was gutsy in this, for getting involved. Why? Very few celebrities that I've seen support issues that don't affect the majority of people in a commercial way. Like farm workers, they have no lobby. You know, politicians don't care about farm workers. At the same time, the way farm workers are exploited is directly controlled by the economics of the food chain. Mm. That is the supermarket system. Multi-billion dollar corporations know the conditions of farm workers and choose not to help them. Eva, by supporting farm workers and by you know, supporting the message, the message of this film, is directly in opposition to a number of gigantic Corporate corporations. America. She's gutsy in that sense. It's like she's fighting against multi-billion dollar corporations when she's got nothing to gain. What, for people who watch this uh, film, for people who want to learn more about uh, food chains, what are these workers facing? Be specific. The greatest exploitation, I feel, is poverty. When you can't make ends meet, and you're earning less than minimum wage, you're almost willing working to- Working full-time. Working full-time, 40, 50 hours a week. You're willing to put up with anything. And look at the system. I mean, our farming system actually is a derivative of the plantation system. So conditions, while they're not legally slavery, they can be just as bad. The spectrum includes wage theft, sexual harassment, rape, modern-day right. sla modern slavery. You know, they say that one out of four women in office environments in the United States experience sexual harassment. That figure is nearly four out of five in the field. You're Why? In, you're in an isolated environment. You are poor. You're willing to put up with almost anything so that you can 
get the money to pay for your rent and pay for your child. And you're in a system that's always relied on the poorest, most vulnerable workers in America. So Language matter? The fact that many of these workers do not speak English? These days, the majority of farm workers are undocumented. But if you look at our nation's history, you know, apart from African Amer Africans that were imported as slaves, there have been Chinese, Japanese, Haitians, there have been poor dust bowl migrants. We've always relied on people that have been poor and, in most cases, first generation immigrants. So interesting. We think about this, and many of us don't want to think about where the food comes from, what the food chain is. You've got an interesting reaction from some of the supermarkets, and others have reacted. Well, some have reacted in a positive way, some have not. Those who have responded in a positive way, describe them. So the, the, the great thing is that this is a problem that we can solve. You know, when we look at the difference between conventional food and organic food, there's a big price difference. But the cost to double farm worker wages is just one penny. So our main character is this group, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Could you go back again about the doubling of the price? Farm workers are paid by the piece, which means that they're paid by the pound. Tomato workers get about one penny for every pound that they pick. Double, double their wages. Double their wages requires a penny more. So you go to a supermarket and you pay 99 cents, $1.99 per pound. If you paid one cent more, or if the supermarket paid the farmer one cent more, the wages of the workers would be doubled. It's a very simple situation that people at the top, the, the Publixes, the Krogers, the Safeways, the Fresh Directs, they all know the situation of farm And workers. they did? They, there's a very easy way for them to alleviate this problem. And they did? They haven't. Have not? They have not. Have any of them done anything? The majority of fast food restaurants, from McDonald's to Taco Bell, with the exception of Wendy's, some of the largest supermarkets in this country, Walmart, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, they've all taken a proactive stance to support farm workers by paying an extra penny per pound for their tomatoes. That's what it takes, an extra penny. That's all it takes. But more importantly, they've refused to buy from farms that have human rights violations. So they're using their market power to ensure that there are no human rights violations. The name of the film is Food Chains. And um, by the way, few people should go onto your Twitter account to find out more information, right? Yeah, at Food Chains Film or at www.foodchainsfilm.com. Foodchainsfilm.com. Sanjay, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you very it's much, important my subject, friend. and it is our job in public broadcasting to shed a light on the work of important filmmakers like yourself. Your first film, it will not be your last. Thank you. Thank you. Stay right there. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, we'll be right back right after this. Thank you. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. This, this ain't about principles. This is about votes. You know that's a problem with you liberals. You don't know how to fight. You want to get something done in the real world, Hubert, you're going to have to get your hands wet. Now, you call yourself the leader of the liberal wing of the Democratic Party and show me some <laughs> leadership. That's great stuff. That is from uh, Attorney Award winning play called? All the Way. All the Way. And uh, Robert Schenken is with us. Pulitzer and Tony Award winning playwright. That is yours. You and your team. That's Terrific. It. Brian Cranston, yes. Oh, yeah, I heard of that guy. <laughs> How great was he, is he? Uh, terrific to work with, an absolute pro, great guy, and uh, delivered a blistering performance. You know, it, he won all the awards, including the Tony Award for Best Actor and his first first shot out of the box here playing, on Broadway. Playing Lyndon playing, 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 playing Lyndon Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. You were saying, as uh, Johnson, by the way, remind me, Georgette, we had here... Uh, Brandon um, Dearden. Brandon Dearden, who played uh, Martin Luther King. That's right. Connected, leading up to the signing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Fascinating yeah. stuff. What a great yeah. cast. What was it like for you, who you said right now, we we're just talking about, you're fascinated by Lyndon Johnson, facts, complicated character, play, uh, personality in American politics, American life. What was it like to get the reaction that you got, not just critically, yeah. but had all these people coming to see it? It was very gratifying. It was it was truly gratifying. I, and um, this is a very ambitious project, a big play, twenty actors, three hours, uh, political history, 
you know, not necessarily the sort of thing you would uh, expect to see on Broadway, and to be as successful as it was, just in commercial sense, uh, you know, we set two box office records for our highest weekly gross for a new play in, in Broadway history. But what it did in terms of the national conversation about Lyndon Johnson, about politics, um, I think was the most satisfying part of this. Um, we had people who, who had, like myself, who had lived through this period and had very, very strong emotional feelings about it. This is a ramp up to Vietnam, of course. Um, and uh, some of this w was a revelation to them. And then we had a whole other segment you of... You mean that Johnson was, in fact, a legitimate, the, bona fide supporter of the civil rights movement and while there were practical politics involved, um, in many ways more so than Kennedy. Not just a, a supporter, a leader. Yes, and, and, and without him? And considerably more than Kennedy. No, I don't think it would have happened Got without it. him. I don't, think, I don't think anybody else could have done what Lyndon Johnson did. Revealing. And, and, and people have the domestic success, the enormous progressive agenda success, I think has, uh, has been overwhelmed by the emotional response to Vietnam. And now, 50 years later, I think we're in a period of re-examination, um, re-evaluation. People are beginning to look again at the Johnson administration. Uh, partially it's because he was so successful in terms of legislation, and today, of course, with the gridlock in Congress, we, we look at that and we think, ah, if only we could get a little bit of that. He got so much done, never mind. Uh, we don't editorialize as anchors here in public broadcasting, mm. but people can decide for themselves how much or how little is getting done in Washington. The Great Society. The Great Society is the sequel. All the way goes from November 1963 to November 1964 and his landslide victory. The Great Society picks up November 1964 and goes through to March 1968 when Lyndon Johnson goes on television and shocks the This country. is your new play? The new play. Playing where? Playing at the moment at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, which is where All the Way had its world premiere, and moving with a new uh, uh, remounting of All the Way to the Seattle Repertory Theater in mm. Seattle, Washington, which commissioned The Great Society. For, for the first time, both plays will play in rotating rep together. You know, it's so interesting. As, as a student of American politics and government, I'm fascinated by um, the work that you're doing. And I think to myself, you know, so many people argue that America, the vast majority of Americans are not interested in politics, in government, in policy. And your work is clearly demonstrating that if you present it in a certain way that is engaging, mm. is provocative, mm. is substantive, and dare I call it entertaining, Yes, absolutely. How dare we? Uh, absolutely. Um, we try to be all those things in public broadcasting. It can draw an audience and can get us to think. But when I think about the Great Society, and I think about what that was, and for those who don't realize this, the Great Society was the name of a whole range of programs in the Lyndon Johnson administration. His ideal vision of America, a, a federal government that actively sought to make life better. Excuse me, not for, to be confused with for, the contract with America, not to be on America, not at all. Or, a very different thing. Yes. Very different thing. That was the, that, that was the. In, in fact, contract for America has a very different. Yes, the, that was the new Gingrich antithetical view. A of, different view uh, of the involvement of federal government or the uh, lack of. The, but or, go ahead. Or, yeah, but the Lyndon uh, Johnson. So the great, the great Society was the name given to this whole host of progressive legislation that he actually created, such and, as and such as Medicare. Medicaid, environmental law. Things we take for granted. Uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Say that again? The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. <laughs> Didn't exist before that. Johnson and his team said is... the federal government needs to do what with respect to public broadcasting? We ought to be involved. We ought to support this. This is a good idea. I, here's a story. I love this. This is uh, um, uh, um, um, Joe Califano Jr., who was Lyndon Johnson's chief of domestic the of, staff. The head of uh, housing, H-E-W. Uh, well, for, for Carter, he was. For Carter, but, but he before began that, his political life that's right. as Johnson's chief of staff for domestic policy. When you worked for Johnson, you had to be available 24-7, and God help you if you weren't. Well, the one time Joe was not available, Johnson tracked him down in a fury and said, where are you? And Joe said, well, I'm at the hospital. He said, well, 
so his tone changed. He said, well, what's going on? He said, well, my son, my toddler, son got into the medicine cabinet and he swallowed aspirin. We're pumping his stomach. And, oh, my gosh, how is that? And they got to talking. Johnson said, you know, how did that happen? He said, well, he just, you know, he got the bottle open. And Johnson said, well, you know, that shouldn't happen. And weeks later, he sends a bill to Congress to mandate childproof locks on medicine cabinets and bottles. I mean, this and is... And which federal agency, was it the FDA that had... That would be the F uh, FDA, yeah. That they had to then enforce this right. legislation that heretofore hadn't existed. But it's, the, it's this notion of problem, ah, <laughs> solution, legislation, get it done. I, I mean, that's the kind of thing that you, you can't help but admire about Lyndon Johnson. I mean, the truth is, we live in Lyndon Johnson's world. This is something that people are not aware of, but this... The society that mm. we uh, and and the benefits and and disadvantages that we enjoy are a direct product of Lyndon Johnson's vision of the United States in the Great Society. Wow. And at some point, Great Society coming to our neighborhood here. In well, the we heart certainly of hope so. Uh, we've got a fantastic review from the New York Times. Uh, HBO film. Uh, there is an HBO film of All the Way. Uh, of All the Way. With Brian Cranston, Steven Spielberg producing. Who is that again? Uh, Steven Spielberg. I've heard of that yeah. guy. <laughs> Very excited, because Steven, of course, is a filmmaker who loves politics and understands politics. So we expect to be in production on the HBO film version of, of All, All the, the Way, way uh, uh, next year. And then we hope to be in New York with The Great Society, perhaps in 2016. Well... Our hope is that the HBO film generates interest in the other part of the story, the second part, if you will, the yeah. Great Society yeah. piece. And, um, and we'll find out if there's a third part after no, this. No, do, do what I'm done. <laughs> do what I'm done. <laughs> well, uh, Robert, I just cannot thank you enough. Oh, it, um, pleasure. Being a Pulitzer and Tony Award winning playwright is great, um, but I have a feeling your work is far from done. And we appreciate everything you've done to help us understand very important parts of American history, particularly the part that often not misunderstands, but doesn't understand the complete picture of mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson. So thank you so much. Thank Stay you. Right there. A pleasure. Appreciate it. Stay right there. Uh, we'll be right back right after this. Thank you very much. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Kevin Cook is the author of a fascinating book, um, Kitty Genovese, The Murder, The Bystanders, The Crime That Changed America. Good to have you with us, Kevin. Good to be here. 1964, Kitty Genovese is killed. A little past the 50th anniversary, if you will. Uh, the show will air well after that as well. Um, Kitty Genovese was who? Uh, she was a, a bartender uh, in Queens, a, a likable, popular, energetic, hardworking young woman, uh, came from Brooklyn. Uh, her family uh, joined a lot of uh, families from Brooklyn and uh, the boroughs that, that, that went away, went to the suburbs mm. in the early 60s. She graduated from high school and loved the city and wanted to stay. Uh, she lived in, as you say, 1964, a fascinating time, a transitional time when the uh, city was changing so quickly. And, Kew Gardens? And, uh, yes, Kew Gardens, right. which was a very safe sure. place to live. People left their uh, doors open. At night, Girl Scouts are coming around selling cookies. Uh, people are answering each other's phones when it rings just to help out. It was a out. neighborhood. It was, it was a, a very friendly neighborhood, she working home class. home from work one night, what happened? She was. Uh, she was attacked out of nowhere. Uh, to me, the primordial fear that people have. Uh, you're alone in the dark and something springs out of the darkness. It was a monster. There are monsters out there, I think. And uh, it was a man who was looking at random for a young woman to kill. Uh, and uh, he stabbed her twice. Of course, it becomes famous in an interesting way. This becomes famous as the story in which all of her neighbors, 38 precisely neighbors, watched out their windows. Was it a courtyard? Kitty was slain. It was not a courtyard. It was a street, Austin Street and Kew Gardens, storefronts. Uh, there's an apartment building across the street. There are apartment windows yeah. on both sides. Could they the see it happening? They, some people could. She screamed. She screamed loudly enough to wake people. It's 3 in the morning. People are groggily getting out of bed, trying to get to the window to see what's happening. It's a dark night. They're looking out. We don't even have the... Uh, contemporary uh, streetlights that sure. we have today. Those grew, as many other things did, out of the outcry over this case. 
Uh, people were confused. There were some people who knew what was going on. Uh, there were others who didn't. And in a year and a half of working on this case, I found that it was a lot more complicated and a more fascinating study and a more fascinating person uh, than anybody, I think, had known about. But Kevin. for those who did, in fact, see something and knew something horrible mm -hmm. was happening, did any of them pick up the phone and call the police? They did not. It was harder to... Well, in fact, one did. The police didn't record that call. Uh, my investigation found uh, uh, a young man who was 14 at the time who swears that his father called the police, and they did not send a car at that time. There were reasons not to send a car. I mean, one way you call the police in those days, there is no 911. 911 came out of the outcry from this case. Uh, you call, you get the precinct, you're often invited to mind your own business. The police have a lot to do. People hear things in, in the middle of the night. People get in fights and yell in the middle of the night. There's a bar that stays open until 3 a.m. on this very block. They were used to loud noises. So there was a lot of hesitation. There's a lot of confusion. Uh, there were people, more than 38 people probably, who heard Kitty's screams. She was murdered over a 30-minute period. Over a 30-minute period. And the way this story has come down over these 50 years and been understood by most people and is still taught in college classes, that those people, the neighbors, witnessed this whole 30 minutes. And it's not so. It didn't happen that way. She bravely got up after a man, after Kitty was initially stabbed, a man across the street lifts his window. He's a concerned neighbor and yells, leave that girl alone. The killer, a man named Winston Mosley, then runs off to wait to see what will happen. Now, windows are popping on on Is both sides Mosley? of the street. There's Winston Mosley, yes, after he was captured. Doesn't later. Mosley come back? He escaped from Attica five years no, later. No, no, no. Doesn't Mosley come back to... Uh, yes, Kill exactly. Kitty? That's right. Uh, he came, comes back after waiting to see if there are sirens, after right. waiting to see if people Nothing pour happens. out of the buildings. He waits. Nothing happens. And in the meantime, Kitty has, has bravely stood. Had she stayed where she was, all these people could have seen her out of their windows. Instead, she tried to get home. And home was around the corner, into the darkness, the entrance in the back of her apartment building, by the railroad tracks. Uh, the Long Island railroad tracks are right behind this building. That's where she tried to get. She couldn't get there. She was been stabbed. She was very weak. She fell into another entranceway where, for a moment, she found solace and safety, she thought. She couldn't climb the stairs. She collapsed at the, at the bottom of the uh, stairs. And that, those stairs, and that is when Winston Mosley came back. He tried a couple of doors. They were locked. He tried that door and found Kitty lying at the bottom of the stairs. And then, as he later told police, he finished what he had done. She was not fatally injured until that second attack by Mosley. And there was one man at the top of the stairs who did open his door and saw what was happening. He knew who Kitty was. He was the witness. We do know how many witnesses there were, eyewitnesses to the final, the fatal stabbing of Kitty Genovese. There was one. And I grew up as a kid hearing about Kenny Jarvis, even though I was in New Jersey and my father used to talk about her all the time. You know, it was like, I used to think sometimes because she was Italian-American, but, but it was there a million reasons. She was a working class person and we were working class people. Right. Queens was very much like the neighborhood we grew up in. Mm -hmm. But then he used to tell me the story, his version, right? because people didn't know, that you never let people if someone's attacking someone, we had a responsibility to step in. You could not be a bystander. That was his interpretation of it, because his interpretation was based on media reports. True. Some of them wrong, mm -hmm. some of them incomplete, whatever. What do you take away from all this? Well, I believe that a lot of positive uh, uh, social change came about, including the 911 system, including the belief that we should intervene when we can. Um, uh, victims' rights grew out of this. Uh, and it was really a misunderstanding of what happened that night. Uh, and in some ways, Kitty has been treated as an urban martyr. And I don't think she has to symbolize something to be important for her well, life to matter. What do you want her to life matter. to mean and her death to mean? I want, I want her life to be as singular as any of our lives. I, I thought that uh, she's been known only as a victim. And, and she was an admirable, energetic, likable young woman mm. who deserved to have her life story told as well as the death. I do think that all the discussion 
of this case and the way it's been reported and understood for 50 years has encouraged people to get involved. I mean, one of the most remarkable reactions was by Chesley Sullenberger, mm. who uh, remembered, he was in Captain. Texas. Captain Chesley, Captain, Captain Sully. Sully. Uh, who was in Texas in middle school That's reading right. about Kitty Genovese. And he vowed at the time, if I ever had a chance to save some people's <laughs> lives, I'm going to do what I can. Yeah. And, and he, but he, like many people, saw New on York. On the Hudson River, he stepped he up. He did. He had seen New York as a cold, unfeeling place. He lands his plane and saves his passengers' lives on the Hudson. He's then out on the, on the wing of the plane with his passengers, and he sees New Yorkers coming out on boats to try to do what they can to help. And he felt something must have changed in that cold, hard city. Uh, I, think, I think the case, as it's understood, came to supposedly explain mm. awful things about city life. Um, some of those are true, and some of them turned out not to be true. You know, uh, some of it, the media reports, not right, some incomplete, some as numbers. But you've done an important work here. Uh, Kevin Cook, Kitty Genovese, the murderer, the bystanders the crime that changed America. Um, it's all right here. And I want to thank you for documenting that, for doing the research, and for helping us to understand why Kitty Genovese's death, but more importantly, her life mattered so much. We appreciate you uh, doing this important work. Thanks thank so you, much. Kevin. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center, Berkeley College, Qualcare Inc., NJM, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Natural Gas, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by Commerce Magazine and by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Company offers policies that can protect against auto accidents, fires, windstorms, floods, and many other serious and urgent situations. Tips on what to do before, during, and after you're confronted with the unexpected are on the emergency preparedness section of NJM.com. New Jersey manufacturers, helping the Garden State prepare for the unexpected for nearly a century.